everyone can uh, take their seats so we can uh, we can get started so um, uh, good afternoon everyone my name is Gay Min Yi I'm the uh, technical director of the i Energy Center so uh, welcome to today's uh, seminar uh, also want to say a welcome to those that are viewing uh, today's uh, talk uh, via the internet um, today's speaker is uh, Mark Madeira he is the uh, director of the Western Cooling Efficiency Center uh, he is from UC Davis, where he is uh, the Semper Energy Chair in Energy Efficiency, uh, Professor in Civil and Environmental Engineering, and Associate Director of the Ener Energy Efficiency Center. Uh, he was the founder and president of a company called Aero Seal, a company that diagnoses and seals leaky air ducts. Uh, the technology was developed uh, by Dr. Madeira while he was a staff scientist at LBNL uh, for 25 years. Uh, Aeroseal was sold to the Carrier Corporation, but was later purchased back by a group of private investors. And uh, if, uh, if there is time later, maybe uh, Dr. Madeira can talk a little bit about uh, Aeroseal and the technology. Um, Dr. Madeira's research uh, interests include energy efficiency, ventilation, and indoor air quality. Uh, Dr. Madeira holds uh, degrees in uh, uh, BE, MS, and PhD degrees uh, in mechanical engineering. Let's welcome uh, Dr. Madeira. Thank you. Um, I guess I should also say I'm, I'm actually a professor of mechanical engineering also now at Davis, if that matters for any fans. I don't want them to be, feel dissed. Um, at any rate, what I'm going to give you today is sort of a Whitman sampler. Basically, I, for those of you who want deep technical details, you'll have to wait till afterwards, because what I'm going to do is going to bounce through a whole bunch of different kind of sort of an introduction to the center that I run, as well as sort of bouncing through different projects and talking about what we do in those particular projects. So to start with, the Western Cooling Efficiency Center was created in 1997. No, excuse me, 2007, sorry. The decades, they kind of run through a little bit. Um, so it was created in 2007. There was a contest by the, something called the California Clean Energy Fund to create the first energy efficiency center at a university. And Davis wound up winning. And the sort of the cornerstone of their proposal was to deal with the cooling. And the issue is that we wanted to do more than just be a university center where basically you do the research, you throw it over the fence, and you hope that someone catches it. So in our mission statement, basically the idea is that what we try to do is to do research, to work with partners throughout industry, throughout utilities, et cetera, to see, see what we can do to actually move the needle. In other words, sort of change things with respect to cooling. So you might ask, why would you start a cooling center? And from a very sort of simplistic perspective, the load factor for cooling, and what we mean by load factor is essentially if you imagine you've got any sort of electrical load on your, on your grid, you're, you're, you're an electric utility, you have a load on your grid, load factor is pretty much the amount of energy that uses compared to how much energy you would use if we were on 24-7. So effectively, you, you're going to build a power plant to serve an electric load. And from the point of view of cooling, the residential, a residential air conditioner, its load factor is 7%. So that's effectively saying that what you'd have to do is you'd have to build a power plant and only use it 7% of the time at in, in, in some level. I mean, you just turn down, et cetera, et cetera. But, but roughly speaking, it's not a very good use of resources. Uh, for non-res cooling, it's a little better than that. But actually, if you just look at the cooling part alone, they, they'd lump in a bunch of fan power into the non-residential part. So it's maybe 12% for the actual cooling all by itself. What happens is all these air conditioners, they come on at the same time and you've got to service that load. So the actual marginal cost of providing that is very high. And it's hard to recapture that from, if, to, to charge a true cost. So it's particularly bad in Western climates. Hence, for, so that was why cooling center. For Western cooling center, Western climates are much worse than other places because of two things. One is they're rather large diurnal temperature swings, and the other is that there's rather low outdoor humidity. What that means is that there's actually very little cooling load in the evenings. Either do the sun goes down, the cooling needs go down, 
and there's not a bunch of humidity requiring you to do dehumidification during the evening. So the end result is you wind up where the load all spikes all at the same time, and it makes it a much more, I mean, th this effect exists in other parts of the country, but it's much more uh, severe in the West. Okay, so we have, I think we're up to 25 people, something like that. We've got a bunch of grad students, engineers, and we're part of something called the Energy Efficiency Center at UC Davis, as I mentioned earlier. The other part of our team, if you'd like, is we set up a corporate affiliate program, whereby what we try to do is we try to bring together manufacturers, utilities, research organizations, and even end customers like Walmart and Target. Uh, in the case of Walmart and Target, what they do is they allow us to play in their stores, basically. Uh, the other thing we do is we work with very large HVAC manufacturers and very small ones. And the trick is to try to figure out ways to have the small ones get their products adapted by adopted into the product mix of the large ones, because the large ones essentially have all the distribution channels to run, to run the market. So we try to figure out how to trick them into making nice with each other. Again, at a simple introductory level, if you'd like, this is a crude diagram of a vapor compression air conditioner. And in brief, what you're doing is you're pumping heat in the wrong direction. And those, anybody's familiar with thermodynamics, the more, the more wrong the direction is, sort of the, the bigger the temperature difference you have to pump through, the more work you have to put in in order to do that pumping. And so part of what we do is figure out how do you reduce that temperature differential. Uh, from the point of view of the condenser side or the hot side, you can use evaporation to reduce the temperature at the condenser side. From the point of view of the other side, right, on the sort of in, on the evaporator side in, in, in your building where you're doing the cooling, you would like to increase that temperature. And so effectively, these are two, of, two examples. There are quite a few examples of what we try. But one, one is to do evaporative pre-cooling and condensers, and another is to do radiant cooling on the inside. And in both cases, you get to reduce that temperature differential. I'm going to sort of breeze through this. Uh, we do work in residential. Um, we do a lot of work in light commercial and, commercial and retail. Part of the reason for that is it tends to be a sector that tends to get ignored. If, you, if you're looking at a, a large commercial building, what happens in a large commercial building is you actually have engineers designing it, and sometimes you even have engineers running it. If you look at the smaller buildings, they tend to be commodity. It's sort of like a home. You buy, you buy a box. It's called an RTU, a rooftop unit. And we've spent a lot of time trying to address that niche because something like 70% of the cooling is, is done in that space, yet the, techno the technology there is more or less an off-the-shelf technology. We work in multifamily, sort of hotels, dormitories, um, hospitality sector. Um, we also have something where we work actually with a group called CIEE, and we do HVAC technology demonstrations. So we take technologies that were developed by PEER, which is a public interest uh, energy research, and we try to demonstrate those technologies mostly on UC campuses, but also in other places. Finally, we do codes and standards. Like I said, we try to, try to cover every base to sort of make it that whatever we do sort of makes it into the world. And then a number of, number of the things we do are not divided sort of by sector, but rather cut across all different, all different types of work. So that was just a little bit of introduction. So now let's give some examples of, of kind of research that we've done. What you see here, if these are people rolling out basically plastic tubing in, in a Walmart store. And what we figured out was a way to incorporate the radiant, this is, this is to do radiant cooling in the store. What we figured out was a way to incorporate it into their construction process. They actually do not use rebar in their stores. They, they, they make a roadbed technology, and then they'll, they'll, lay, they'll pour their concrete right on top of that. And so we had to not disrupt their normal construction process, but we managed to do it and to, well, step back for a second. 
what, what are you trying to do? Why would you do radiant cooling? Well, for one thing, it reduces excess latent cooling, meaning a lot of times with an air conditioner, it takes out more moisture out of there than you need taken out. And it also significantly reduces blower energy. It's much easier to pump X number of BTUs in the form of water than to pump it in the form of air in terms of the efficiency, the pumping costs. It also makes non-compressor cooling a possibility. Because you've got essentially a very large heat exchanger here, you don't have to cool it down quite as, quite as much to create the same amount of cooling in the space. What that means is that you don't have to make the, the coolant quite as cool, which means you can make more use of evaporative cooling. In other words, you can cool the water evaporatively rather than with vapor compression. In the end, we got Walmart to put these in their several stores. Um, I, it still says projected savings, which kind of annoys me because we still don't have a good measurement of exactly how much was saved, but sort of very large savings, so on the order of magnitude of 60%. The key thing that we did here was we figured out a way to, and we managed to get a manufacturer to build it, a way to put that tubing in at a cost of roughly $2 a square foot, an installed cost of $2 a square foot, versus a, a standard cost at the time was 6 or $7 a square foot, which would basically change the game. OK, here's one of my pet projects. Um, what you see here, this is a swimming pool at a, I think that's a health club in Concord, actually. And right over here, there's a room. And this room had a million BTU per hour boiler in it. And so on the roof of that building, you had up here, you had, I think it was about 100 tons of air conditioning, which is roughly 1.5 million BTUs that are being rejected. So you're burning gas to heat your pool, and then you're throwing away uh, the heat from your air conditioners to the atmosphere. And so it seemed like it would make sense rather than throwing away that heat, if we could use it to heat the pool, it would make a lot more sense. We didn't start out with the pool. We started out with the house. And one of the things that's sort of, sort of an extra bonus is that not only do you not waste the gas energy, but you actually improve the efficiency of the air conditioner. And what this is here, this is a plot for a residential system of the kilowatt draw of a system that's basically air-cooled versus the same system trying to uh, reject its heat to the pool instead of to the air. Uh, simply, simply noted, if you look at the pool, the pool temperature is not going to go above probably 85 degrees, something like that. It might go to 90. Outdoor air temperature on the peak conditions will go as high as 105, sometimes even 110. Not necessarily in Congress, but in vast parts of California where they do cooling. So the idea was, could we could we manage to, to make this work? In terms of estimating how much you could save without not looking at the gas savings, if you can reduce the refrigerant condensing temperature by 20 to 40 degrees, because not only, not only do you run at a cooler temperature in the pool, but because it's a water to refrigerant heat exchanger rather than an air to refrigerant heat exchanger, your approach or your difference between the, the two fluids can be smaller. So the end result, you predict a savings of roughly between 20 and 50 percent in the EER, or, or in, in metric term, COP. And the highest part is at peak conditions, which is, as we noted earlier, something we really care about. Um, already said that. Um, what I'll show you here is, this is, I don't know if this was in the first paper we did or in the second one, but what we did is we took a house in Sacramento and we actually used the, a heat pump to not only dump the heat from the air conditioner into the pool, but also to cool the pool at night. You could think of it as using your pool as sort of an inexpensive ground source heat pump. So instead of, instead of your, your heat sink and heat source being the ground or being the air, it's actually the water in the pool. And we developed a model. Um, the blue line, which you can't see all that well, was our predictions from our model for what the temperature should be in the pool. And the red is the measured. And you, you can see the oscillations over the course of, what is that, eight months, something like that. And so 
This is in the summer where we're dumping heat into the pool, pool temperatures rising. This is the winter where we're actually cooling down the pool because we're pulling heat out of the pool in order to heat the house via a heat pump. Um, anyway, I'm not going to dwell, like I said, Whitman sampler. Um, I, feel free to ask questions about any of this, but I'll try to get through everything and we can have some time at the end. Okay. Another thing that we did that was less technical and more, if you'd like, strategic, is we wanted to figure out a way to get manufacturers to build more efficient RTUs or rooftop units for the commercial sector, the light, light commercial buildings. So what we did is to come up with a contest to say, okay, if you produce an air conditioner or RTU that's X efficiency, we will get utilities to give you incentives and we'll also get people like Walmart and Target to buy it from you. The challenge with such a challenge is that having worked for a major manufacturer, I mentioned earlier I worked for Carrier, despite everybody thinking that California is a fairly large place and the western states are fairly significant, and, and I agree with that, um, a major manufacturer would rather build one box and sell it over and over again to everybody. So to convince them to go do a complete new design from scratch is very difficult. So we had to figure out the right place to put the target. So what we did is we came up with a target such that a major manufacturer could meet it if they bolted on some pre-existing technologies onto their equipment and not have to engineer it from scratch. And so we came up with a target based upon that. Um, as I said, a ground up redesign eliminates the major manufacturers. And the way they can get around is we designed it so existing, sort of their, their best equipment, if you put something else onto it, it could make it. In terms of the entries, uh, we knew that if you did a hybrid ground up design, a hybrid meaning where you conclude, include evaporation and vapor compression in the right way, you'll be able to sort of come up with the most efficient system for the conditions we care about. We knew the small manufacturers could do that, but that the large ones, um, they wouldn't do it. To give you a little bit of a feel, we had to figure out what, where you want to test. And so the normal test point for this is a normal test point for air conditioners. And what you'll see, it's, it's at a much higher humidity level. Notice the two test points that we picked were more at the 20% RH. This, the test point that's used for normal testing is more at 40% RH. It all, you'll also notice that we went to a much higher temperature for our peak condition. So we have a, a representative point for the year, and another point for the peak conditions. And the upshot is that that's how we set up the contest. This is just showing it compared to one climate zone. That's climate zone 10 in California. So where do you land? So what this is, this is what we also defined is our energy efficiency ratio, or COP. We included all the parasitics, and we, we didn't it's sensible EER, because we don't need a bunch of dehumidification. So if you look at it that way, here's the performance of the minimum standard equipment. This would be during the season. This would be at peak conditions. Notice peak is always worse. Our targets, this is where we figured out our targets could be and still have made manufacturers potentially participate. End result, it, it's roughly somewhere between 40 and 50% savings, both on peak and on energy. But as I noted, if you, went, if you built a, a piece of equipment from the ground up, sort of a complete design, uh, that's a, a company called Coolerado. They were one of our affiliates. Their, their equipment wound up being tested by NREL, and it showed it was 68 and 82%, I think, savings relative to the, to the standard equipment. So in other words, game-changing kind of numbers. Here's an example of sort of how it works. What it does is it does indirect evaporative cooling. Uh, what is meant by that is you don't add any moisture to the indoor air. Anybody here who knows what a swamp cooler is? Basically, it's like a big sponge, 
and you'll, you'll blow air through your sponge and then blow that air into your building. And what you're doing is you're taking the benefit of the fact that the wet bulb temperature of the air is colder than the dry bulb temperature of the air. The problem is it adds humidity to the space and it's not good for every hour of the year. So the idea is if you do it indirectly and you have a multi-stage, which is what's going on in here, you can, you can perform much, much better than that. Um, current status, we've got a number of letters of intent from manufacturers. New ones coming in at 10 and 20 tons. The two that we've tested have been smaller five ton units. And what we're also doing right now is we're actually working with LBNL on an Energy Plus model so that you can model these systems within, within Energy Plus and compare it with any other, any other alternatives. Okay, what I just described might sound nice. You know, we're going to make a contest. People are going to build these nice new boxes. One of the problems, sort of a, if you'd like a fundamental problem with trying to do energy efficiency in the HVAC space, is the stuff lasts too long. I mean, people who buy it might not think that's such a bad thing. However, what happens is it means you don't get very many chances to improve, to, to put in improved equipment. Um, say a light bulb. Light bulb probably lasts about a year. And so every year you're making a decision to put in a new light bulb. Um, an air conditioning unit probably lasts 15 or 20 years, one of these RTUs that we're talking about. So the decision points are sort of few and far between. So one of the things we said is could we have an initiative to try to improve those RTUs without having to replace them? So we, we had another, another project that what we're doing is coming up with a way to try to get the savings in those RTUs more quickly by, by a retrofit program. The challenge is that when somebody's air conditioner breaks or somebody's heating system breaks, they are forced to make a decision. They have to buy a new one. On the other hand, a retrofit decision is a discretionary purchase. In other words, it's not broken. I'm still happy in my space. Yeah, maybe I'm using more energy, but do I want to listen to your song and dance as to why I should fix it? Or do I want to spend my money somewhere else? And, and so the sales costs, the transaction costs, and the implementation costs are all much higher. There's also a lack of standards for performance. You would not believe how many manufacturers we have show up or how many manufacturers show up at the utilities doors with the latest, greatest thing that everything saves at least 30%. Some of them save 50 and most of them are full of it. Some of it, some of it's real, some of it's not. So we needed some sort of standards for figuring that out. So what we've been doing is first coming up with a test protocol, which we're now presenting to ASHRAE, which is the heating and cooling, en ASH heating and cooling engineers, to have some sort of way to test evaporative precoolers, which is one of, one of the key technologies. And then another issue we're doing is looking at how people actually operate their units. Because if you're going to do some efficiency improvement, let's say on your fan to reduce your fan energy, if your fan is only on 20% of the time, the answer is going to look very different than if your fan is on 100% of the time. So we're doing research on those, those types of things in the field. Here's a little example of us setting it up on the rooftop. What we're effectively doing is measuring the efficiency of the equipment on the refrigerant side. So what we do is we look at the refrigerant itself rather than trying to measure on the air side to, to look at improvements in efficiency. Here's some examples of those kind of technologies. Uh, this is something, a technology where you pre-cool the air going to the refrigeration system. So this is for, if you go to any large grocery store, they've got a lot of refrigeration. All that refrigeration, if it's air cooled, you can significantly improve its performance by doing some pre-cooling in front of that air. Um, at the far end there is something called dual cool where what you do is it's retrofitted. This is a standard piece of equipment. You retrofit it on and you've got essentially a big pad here that cools the air before it goes across the condenser. And then you have a sump and you take this sump air and, uh, excuse me, the sump water and run it through a heat exchanger with the outdoor air. Once again, not adding any moisture, but cooling the outdoor air before it comes into the building, the ventilation air for the building. And the one in the middle, 
That's sort of cute, but it's not exactly a game changer. Uh, is, what happens is an air conditioner will wind up condensing water on the evaporator. I know it sounds backwards, but that's actually how it works. What's evaporating inside the evaporator is the refrigerant, and it makes it cold. And then you've got, as the air goes by it, it will condense water on there. That water is typically thrown away, and you have piping systems on roofs that throw away that water. In this case, what we said is, well, why not re-evaporate that water passively with a wicking system? So you create a little sump, and you have a pipe that takes the water from the evaporator, drops it into the sump, and then it wicks up the media and is sucked across the condenser and evaporated that way. The upshot is you can avoid the need for the piping to remove the water from the roof, which is non-trivial cost. And actually, with the cost of copper, believe it or not, it has been a significant problem where people go up on roofs of buildings and steal the copper pipe. So they're now replacing them with plastic. So the upshot is you can maybe not do it at all and get single-digit improvements in efficiency. Um, I'm going to speed it up a little bit. These, here's some data from performance data from the, the various systems that we looked at. This is the dual cool system. Um, this is the wick cool, sort of the monitoring that we did of what's happening to the water in the sump. How does it fill up? What does it do? Um, and I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Um, part of what we also have to worry about is any time you involve water in sort of cooling in buildings or water in general, one of the big issues is the fact that water isn't always as nice and clean and pure as you'd like it to be. And it just so happens that in many parts of the state where evaporative cooling is a really good thing, it's because there's not that much water. And when there's not that much water, they take well water. And when you take well water, it has a lot of dissolved solids in it. So one of the things that's been a sort of black eye over the years for evaporative cooling equipment is how well does it stand up to time if it's not maintained properly. So what this is, is we decided we would try to do some accelerated testing. And so far in my, in my career, I've, ha I've dealt with accelerated testing now three or four times. And every time, it's been sort of a miserable failure. And what I mean by that is, if something is if something is going to break quickly, it's really nice to do accelerated testing. But if something is going to last for a long time, it's hard to accelerate it enough. And so what we have here is we set up a test. This was the first test we set up where we ran continuously for, and we've got it, the x-axis here is gallons of water. So we took one of these evaporative cooling systems and we ran it for, what's it, almost 6,000 gallons of water. At almost 6,000 gallons of water, that's roughly two complete seasons of operation. And we found, right, this is, the, this is the capacity of the equipment. We found that it decreased by, what is that, like 10, less, than, less than 10%. Uh, so then we tried doing it another way. We said, well, let's do it cyclically. Let's let it dry out, wet it, dry out, wet it, on and off, on and off. And then we got a little bit better result. But, but the upshot of all this is that to do this type of testing, this sort of destructive testing, takes an awfully long time and a lot of work. That previous slide, this is what it looked like at the end of those 6,000 gallons. And there's a, that's a five gallon bucket. This is for a piece of equipment maybe this big. There's a five gallon bucket almost halfway full of crud that we scraped out of the system after that time. Yet, it only had a 15% reduction in performance. The upshot being it's a, little, it's a little harder than we'd like to understand what's going on. A um, couple of my graduate students, what they're doing now is trying to figure out how, how is this whole process working. Um, well, let's just throw out the results. In general, we figured out that long test periods were required. And it's not practical for testing water management strategies. Because one of the issues with many of the manufacturers of this equipment, what they'll do is for every bit of water that they evaporate, they'll actually waste another same amount of water for maintenance, meaning to keep things clean in the system. Here's another example. Where we started to look at there's tons of manufacturers with technologies that they can use to, that, that they'll claim will make it that your water will not cause problems in your system. 
And so what we did is we took two particular manufacturers' technologies and we tried to figure out what they would do. And in brief, what we found is there's actually one, com one company, there are many companies actually, who just put a magnet on your pipe. And no one has been able to explain to me, they all wave their arms and make up these stories. No one has been able to explain to me why this should do anything. So now I have one postdoc and one graduate student, and their job is to figure out, does this make any sense at all? I really wouldn't care, except when we did this test here, what we were doing is we, we tried to accelerate the process. So we essentially sprayed water. This is a clean coil. We sprayed water onto the coil. Either that water was untreated or it was treated with two different technologies. The magnet actually made it take 30% longer to clog up. And we have no good explanation for that. And it was reproducible. So now I've got nice chemo, uh, environmental engineering students, a postdoc, who she's trying to figure out, OK, I don't think we did our experiments wrong. Let's, let's see what's the, what's the physics or chemistry that could be causing the effect. It's kind of annoying. Um, no, she's not annoying. She's very good. Um, <laughs> so um, one more other thing, kind of thing we'll pay a little bit of attention to is what we have here. This is a map of California. And what we're looking at is all different places in the state and the color sort of the color of the, of the little bubble tells you what the water is like. So you've got very hard water, moderately hard, um, all the way down to sort of the purple ones are the best. And so part of what we're also looking at is where would you sort of consider first rolling out such technologies? It, it's not where everywhere that it's hot you need uh, to use well water. So for example, simple example is if you look at Davis compared to Sacramento. Sacramento uses river water. Dav Davis uses groundwater. The quality of the water in Davis is horrible. Before, when I first started working there, I'd bring my own water from the Bay Area every day so that I had something to drink. Now, now we pay people to bring it to us. But at, at the, t the, the key point, right, is that you've got very big differences in water quality. And when you look at where do you introduce things, you want to start where it's easiest. OK, we've got another project where one of the big issues, if you wanted to, if you wanted to use evaporative cooling in, a, in California on a significant scale, one of the issues is it uses up a bunch of water. And if it uses up a bunch of water, people like local water authorities, they don't think that's a good thing. And so they push back, like say if the California Energy Commission wants to say let's, let's make, make a standard whereby you could do evaporative cooling or you should do evaporative cooling, it would be problematic. So we've got another couple of grad students, and what they're doing is looking at, can you come up with an inexpensive, practical, sort of idiot-resistant uh, gray water treatment system? Right? So basically, can you take the water from your shower and your non-kitchen sinks and use that for your evaporative cooler? Um, I'm going to speed it up a little here so we have some time for questions. Another grad student, what he's doing is he's coming up with a sort of an evaluation tool for different types of designs for hybrid systems. Interestingly, no one's ever quite figured out what's the right way to combine things, even where to put the evaporator and where to put the condenser in a design. You can, you can make arguments either way, and it's rather an interesting optimization problem. So that's, that's, that's his work. Uh, one other thing he's doing is coming up with a, a model for what's going on inside the wet and the dry channels under all different types of conditions to be able to do an optimization for how, how would you figure out a trade-off between fan power, thermal performance, and water consumption, and sort of resistance to water problems. All right, now my last, I'm going to try to finish up in the next like seven minutes or something like that. I'm going to talk a little bit about some other projects that we have that are not just cooling. Uh, basically, I, I know we're called the Cooling Center, but I happen to have other interests that are related to this. And so um, we're, we're, we're doing them anyway. So here, here's just, just a couple of examples. What this is is the idea here 
is that if you, if you imagine a building has loads, right? You have a, I have a heating load and a cooling load, and I have to meet those loads. And so I have a piece of equipment, an air conditioner or a furnace or a boiler or something like that, that's going to produce either hot or cold fluids of some sort. The way that most buildings work is they transport it around in the form of air. As I mentioned before, it's, it's a very inefficient way to do it. What a number of buildings do, like, like hotels, for example, they use water. So you can take water and you can transport that water over fairly long distances and move a lot of energy that way without as much energy being used to do the transport. Um, if you'd like the trend, there are, there are a number of manufacturers, non-US manufacturers, who are trying to introduce into the market the idea, instead of moving water, why don't you move a phase change material? Because if you move, move a, and otherwise known as refrigerant. So if you move refrigerant around in a building, what that means is that there's the amount of energy stored and transported in one pound of, or one kilogram, whatever you like, right, one unit of mass is going to be much larger for phase change material because you get all the energy associated with the phase change. One of the problems with that is there actually are issues with there being large quantities of refrigerants in buildings. So we've got one grad student. What she's doing is to look at using encapsulated phase change materials. And they actually, you can make it in little, I know that they're micron size and a few micron size. I don't know if they've gotten to the nano size yet. But you get a very small, very small encapsulated phase change beads that can be pumped through your system. And what it does is it allows you to move much more heating or cooling capacity for the same amount of pumping power. And it even looks like it may make some of your heat exchangers actually work better, not worse, which is, which is kind of interesting. So, so that, that's another, another project that we have going. The, our, seems like we should be able to decrease pumping power by as much as 60% and perhaps even improve, improve the rest of the performance. And the first place we're looking at are the fan coil systems in hotels. So in a hotel, what you have in your room, some people want heating, some people want cooling. You've got pipes that run water around the building all the time. And what you do is, is we put this into the system. It'll be a simple retrofit. Here's another example of a project that's sort of not necessarily cooling. Uh, what happens if you go to a hotel? I have a test that I do every time I go to a large hotel. I take a piece of toilet paper and I put it against the grill in the bathroom. And roughly 50% of the time, instead of it being sucked up against the grill, it blows out, which means that my exhaust, instead of being an exhaust, is actually a supply. And there's actually a, sim there's a simple reason for that, is that a building is a big chimney. And if you balance that system at some time in the year, Let's say you, you balance it in the winter. You have to adjust all the resistances of those grills so that everybody's getting the same flow. But now when the weather changes and you flip, and now your, your building is a column of cold air in a hot environment, all that balance doesn't work anymore. So there are manufacturers who produce grills that are essentially pressure independent. So what they'll do is they'll always produce the same flow. And so what we're... What we looked at is, well, can you use those grills? One of the problems we came up with was that those grills need a, a, a given pressure in order to work. And so what was causing the problem is you put the grills in, and then you can't get the pressure because the ducts leak too much. So we actually combined one tech, my duct sealing technology with those guys' technology and used that as a way to reduce, reduce the flow rate through the systems significantly and produce the right flow rate in everybody's, everybody's room all, all through the year. So we did the Wynn Hotel and Encore Hotel and City Center in Las Vegas and try, trying to do more of that. OK. Last, no, I think I got, no, I got a couple more. Um, this is sort of one, of one of my favorite projects. What this is, this is a, we built a wooden box. So it's eight foot tall and it's like eight foot out this way and four feet wide to simulate sort of a, a room in a building. And we want, what we wanted to look at is could we use 
aerosol particles to seal the leaks in that room. The idea being, when you build a house, roughly 35% of the load on that house is created by airflow through the building or air infiltration. And there's been quite a bit of effort, that was what I used to do at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory for years, is look at how do you deal with, with sealing those leaks. And so what we did is the, the technology I developed, that aerosol technology, we wanted to see could we get it, could we use it to seal the leaks in the shell of the building. And so we're doing our first actual house uh, next week, but we did it in the box what we found. We built, we put leaks in the box. So this is a, a blow up. These are in reality about a tenth of an inch across. And so we bunch, put a bunch of slots like that and put them all around the box and then we fogged the box with our sealant. And what we found is that it worked too well the first time. We literally, uh, this part right here where nothing is happening, right, this is the leakage as a function of time. We're just pumping water through the system because it, it's got water built in to start with. And then we start injecting the sealant. So in a space of roughly five minutes, we sealed a hole that is the equivalent of four inches by 10 inches. So that was, that was quite impressive. And so now what we're doing is we're looking at, uh, we, we did a bunch of things to do a bunch of experiments, looking at particle size, et cetera, et cetera. And it seems like it could work quite well. So now we're, we're starting to try it in houses. And I actually am also thinking about and have met with some folks about doing an underground gas pipelines. So there's all these nice words. I've got just a couple of minutes here. A few more items. We're also looking at fault detection and diagnostics. So if you look at a, if you look at one of those RTUs, one of the issues is out of sight, out of mind. Nobody's paying attention to it. It can go off the rails and no one, no one really knows. So the idea is can you build in fault detection and diagnostics into this equipment? And part of what we're doing is we're working, the way to start moving the industry a little bit is if you start creating a standard that manufacturers feel like they might have to pay attention to, that's one way to push and that's what, one of the things we're doing. We even are paying attention to maintenance behavior, not just from the point of view of having a box sort of magically tell you that you have a problem, but also how do people interact? And this would be more, mostly on the residential side, but also in potentially in light commercial. And the idea is that people do sort of have got it in their head that you have to take your car to get it serviced every once in a while. Um, it does not seem to have entered into most people's consciousness that your air conditioner or your furnace or anything like that somehow isn't going to last forever and is going to work perfectly without you paying any attention to it. So we're, we've got focus groups and various other ways. We, we hired a, a sociologist to work in the center. Um, similarly, and this is a project that stems from some work done at LBNL. The fellow is one of my grad students, had done work with looking at people trying to program their programmable thermostat. And they actually took videos and, and they, they measured how long it took someone to do something like change the temperature or change the time. And they took all the different devices and took people off the street and had, had them try it. And in fact, um, the one that was top rated by Consumer Reports, well, I think was the worst in terms of somebody actually being able to use it, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, so one of, the, one of the projects is to look at the same type of thing, but looking forward to the use of home energy displays, in, in home energy displays, to see whether or not uh, we can do anything better than what's happening. Um, okay, I think well, I left five minutes for questions. So now feel free to ask a question on any of those things or anything else you want to ask a question about. Thank okay. you. Uh, open the floor for questions. Wow. The automatic sealant thing was pretty cool. Can you explain a little bit more about how that works and what materials you use and the process? Okay. Um, okay. In brief, um, I'll explain it for duct systems, and it works very similar for the shell like that, is that 
if you, if you have a space and the only place for the, and you, and you close all the intentional openings in that space. So in a duct system, you'd close the grills. In a house, you close the windows and the doors and you pressurize it with the fog. The only place for that fog to leave the space is through the leaks. And so what happens is the particles are carried with the air. And if, if here's a leak, as the air comes by to go through the leak, it's going to turn sharply to go out. So effectively, the particle will skid out and not make the turn. So in, in the early days, we, we actually did videos of this, where you've got, here, we made a slot. And you could watch it build up along the sides of the slot on both sides. And effectively, what you're doing is you're playing with the Stokes number of the particle as it wants to, as it wants to make that turn. It's not able to make it, and it builds up on, on the edges of the leak and seals it. Is that yeah. an adequate explanation? Yeah. And do we have any more questions? OK, I guess we're, we're done. Well, thank you, Mark, for a wonderful talk.